Well, praise the Lord. Once again, it is our pleasure to bring you greetings in the wonderful name of Jesus. <clears throat> he is a merciful, ever-loving God. Thank God for that. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come and assemble ourselves together here today in this is your house. We come to seek, we come to receive, and we come to find. You said if we would not, it would be open unto us. If we would seek, we would find. Therefore, we come here today knocking and seeking. And we're going to leave, we know, with a blessing from you. We thank you for this fellowship, or for this organization that you have established here. It is a light, not only to this community, but it reaches out through the airwaves, by the way, the internet, by the way of the tapes and DVDs that are made here from the speakers. As these things travel all over the world, they're doing your bidding, Lord. We ask that you continue to bless this effort and those that work so hard to keep it working. Thank you once again. Pray for the sick and afflicted. We do not forget our service people. We pray for them wherever they are, around the world, as they stand in defense of our freedom. We pray for our leaders, that you might endow them with wisdom to be able to perceive the path that you would have them go. In your precious name, we invite you to be in charge of this meeting. May everything said and done would be according to your will. Amen and amen. You know, when all else fails, it's always a good idea to read the manual. <laughs> this, of course, is a manual. And if we would have read it first, where it said in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, study to show yourself approved unto God. By learning to rightly divide the word of truth. Maybe we would not have had such a division within the church. Maybe we would not have had many different waves of doctrine if we would have just obeyed the manual and actually learned to rightly divide the word of truth. How do we really and truly divide the word of truth? We have to know a lot about the Bible to understand how to do it. First thing we have to know that this is a gold mine. And the only way you get nuggets out of a gold mine is dig. You have to dig them out. Yes. Therefore, this should become your first food before breakfast every morning. Amen. First thing we do at my house, we take this Bible down. Before we eat any physical food, we have to read from this Bible every day. Amen. Every day. No exception. Every day. Then we learn to study like we studied in school. You just don't go in the classroom and read your lesson. You study it. Because you know they're going to give you a test on it. And you're going to have to know what it's teaching. This Bible said do the same thing. Study to show yourself, to show yourself a proof unto God. A workman that needeth not be ashamed by rightly dividing the word of truth. First thing we have to know about the Bible, it is not, and I say it again, it is not in chronological order. The subjects that we deal with are scattered from Genesis to Revelation throughout the entire Bible. Now suppose we're dealing with one particular subject and we want to find out how to rightly divide the subject, that particular subject. Say, for instance, let's take the subject of faith. We're faith people. 
We believe that salvation is a gift through grace by faith. It came to us with no cost to us at all. But Jesus paid a tremendous cost for this. But we receive it freely. We cannot earn it, and we never deserve it. It comes by grace, through faith by grace. What is grace? Grace is simply an unmerited favor, undeserved, unearned favor granted by Jesus Christ. That's what faith is. The Bible, you know, talks about four different kinds of faith. Do you know what they are and where they are? And which one we really need? All faiths begin with intellectual faith, which starts right up here. But then, it is incumbent upon you to move that intellectual faith where it becomes real saving faith. It doesn't become real saving faith till it gets down here. Romans 12 verse 3 said God gave it to you up here. That's intellectual faith. The same faith that Satan himself uses to believe that Jesus is real. But he's not saved. His faith did not save him because he didn't have the real saving faith. He had intellectual faith. Every human being born, including the most dead-set atheist, was born with the same amount of faith that God gave you. Romans chapter 12 verse 3 said he gave every human being born a measure of faith. You were born with it. It was absolutely necessary because you are a finite creature. And God is an infinite creature. It is impossible for a finite creature to believe in an infinite creature. Because a finite creature is controlled by his physical senses. And they will never know an infinite creature. They can know nothing beyond that invisible wall that separates the physical from the spiritual. Therefore, God had to give us intellectual faith. It is by that gift we can believe in an infinite God. Without that intellectual faith, we could not even believe that He existed. But because He gave us that faith, we can believe that He exists. But that's not saving faith. He gave you that up here. You look at those lights, you know they shine because you can see it. Electricity is turned on. You know that by that intellectual faith. But that infinite God you cannot see with your physical eyes. And yet you have to move that faith from your head to your heart. The longest 12 inches in your life. He gave it to you up here. But it's not real saving faith till it gets down here. And it has a lot of trouble, according to the Bible, getting down here. In between up here and down here is two major roadblocks that you have to overcome. The first one is temporary. The second one is dead. You start out with intellectual faith and you want to make it into real saving faith. And you've got to move it from your head to your heart. God gave it to you to begin with. And then he instructed you to contend daily once for the faith that was delivered to the saints. Through your contention, you're going to have to move it from your head to your heart. And you're going to discover that's the longest 12 inches in your life. In moving that faith from your head to your heart, you've got to fight every day the greatest enemy you will ever encounter. S-E-L-L. Because this flesh cannot know the infinite God. And every day it cries out to you, fool, don't you know you're wasting your time? It will never know the God. What does it want to do? This old flesh wants to 
It's like the commercial they once had television. It says life goes around one time. Get all the gusto out of it you can. That's what the spirit of doubt is telling you. Don't waste your time trying to move it. Just get the gusto out of life. So the great, one of the greatest enemies you're going to fight is yourself. Flesh. Wow. Flesh. It will never know that infinite God. For you to know Him, you're going to have to work. Learn to rightly divide the word of truth. How did we do that? We take one subject, just one single subject first. And we start at Genesis and we go to Revelation. And we list every, every verse in the Bible that relates to that subject. And we put them together. The sum total of those verses have now established the correct scriptural doctrine of that particular subject. That's how you prove what you believe. Put it to the test. Put it to the test of rightly dividing the word of truth. Excuse me a minute, I dropped my little computer, which I brought just to show you how easy it is. Just how easy it is to rightly divide the word of truth. Now when I was in college and in the seminary, in those days, we didn't have these little electronic gadgets. That meant when we went to study every subject, what we had to do was physically search the Bible in order to know where every one of those verses are. We see this little gadget would cost me forty dollars, I think maybe thirty-five. Is it Franklin? Bible verse. Now what I do, say for instance we want to find out about faith. I just turn it on, I mash this button, and I type in F-A-I-T-H. <laughs> then I press this button. <laughs> and it tells me that 374 verses in the Bible relate to faith. Wasn't that fast? <laughs> now you can study all day long, but now it's going to tell me more. Well, where are those verses? I press the next verse then, the next button, and it tells me that so many of them in the Old Testament, so many of them in the New Testament. Then I press the next button, and it starts counting. It starts to each one of those verses. And every time you press the button, it'll go to the next verse until it covers all 300 of them. And you have them all. You know where they're at. And then you just write them down. All of those verses. Let them stand. And the sum total. The sum total will establish the correct scriptural doctrine. Now that's simply a little learn jap. A learn jap we gave this morning. Another little something free. <laughs> because it's very important that you need to know how to write and divide the word of truth. I'm going to teach this morning just a little bit. I don't have too much time, but I'm going to teach a little bit on a new book I have been researching for 30 years. It's not yet print. It's not yet in print. Not quite through with it yet. We've been researching it for 30 words. It's an explosion, or I say expose, of every phase of spiritual warfare beginning in the front to go to the back and spent 30 years researching it so far and we're not through with it yet so I have part of the manuscript here uh, but I haven't finished it all yet we're still working it we hope to have it published soon uh, and we will read a little bit from the manuscript because this is 30 years of work a lot of work in researching and rightly dividing the word of truth to try our very best to establish the correct scriptural doctrine in, on every phase of spiritual warfare as the Bible tells it. Going all of our researches, of course, uh, uh, in researching most of my books, I was privileged to know the lady that was a head librarian for, part, for one branch of the United States Navy. And she had 
access to all the libraries of the world. And when I wanted the subject researched, she, she would research that subject from the libraries for me. And she sent me tons of information, all of which I could not use because the books would have to be as big as the information contained. So we had to choose and go through them and study. And it's the same in, in writing this particular book that we're trying to write now. We try to take one phase of spiritual warfare at a time, beginning at the first and going to the end, to try to correctly establish the scriptural doctrine of that particular area what we're trying to teach. We start out with a little story, like all the Sabbaths as far back as she could remember, she was in the synagogue. After all, she was a daughter of Abraham a good Jewish doctor, a daughter, and she was not about to miss the service in the synagogue, no doubt. Like most of the people there that day, she was curious about the young man holding the book of the law and teaching for him. And so many, all of most of the people there were all curious. They were more curious about the man that was teaching than about what he was teaching. She, she probably thought to herself, who is this man? Why are so many people talking about him? What makes him so different? I will try to get a little closer to him. Maybe I can see what makes him different. She tried to make her way through the crowd. It was hard because she was all bowed from the waist and could not stand up straight. She had been that way for 18 years with this strain condition or sickness, whatever it was. It was so hard for her to try to make it through the crowd. She just couldn't straighten herself up. Nonetheless, she continued in her tilt to get close to him. The young man was teaching from the book of the law when suddenly he looked up. As his eyes pierced through the crowd, they came to rest upon the bowed lady. In a firm, commanding voice, he beckoned her to him. As she approached, trembling, he reached out his hand, and as he touched her, he commanded, Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. To the astonishment, the amazing astonishment of the crowd, immediately she straightened up. For 18 years she had been this way, no human could help her, no doctor. Then without even asking, this strange young man worked that great miracle. The greatest gift of all, the healing of her body. What a great gift, what a miracle. The people began to rejoice, but there were those in the crowd who were jealous of this young man. They were looking for an excuse to condemn him. Can you believe that? If you saw that happen right here before your eyes, would you be jealous of the one that was standing up? Yet there was people there was jealous of him. They didn't want him to do those things. They didn't even want to see those things. This was the Sabbath after all. You're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. The Sabbath was holy. No work was to be done on the Sabbath. They began to whisper and backbite among themselves as they plotted to trap him. He was able to perceive their thoughts. Immediately he confronted them with their own hypo hypocritical ways by reminding them how each of them would take their own animals to drink water on the Sabbath, which required a whole lot, a whole lot more physical work than he used to heal that woman. What I read was the account <clears throat> of the healing of the bowed lady by Jesus as recorded in Luke chapter 13, verse 10 through 17. Here's some points we want to learn about this. The infirmity was not physical. It was spiritual. It was spiritual. She didn't know that. Nobody in the crowd knew that. 
she thought she had some kind of strange disease, some kind of sickness that no doctor knew anything about or could help her. But it wasn't a disease. It was a demon spirit. A demon spirit. <clears throat> she was Jewish. She was not a Samaritan. She was the daughter of the king. She was in the seminary on the Sabbath, I mean in the synagogue on the Sabbath day where she was supposed to be, where she no doubt had been there every day of her life since she was old enough to go. She come because she believed that was the way, the only way she had of worshiping God and praising God was to attend to those services in the seminary. She was doing her best to follow the law as she knew it. She was healed by an act of deliverance, not by any medicine or any physical treatment. She was a daughter of Abraham. Now we know that from our study in spiritual warfare that demons, can actually attack human beings in three separate ways. Number one, they can tempt you and attempt to lead you into sin. <clears throat> Number two, they can afflict you. Number three, they can obsess you. They, we call those three methods their own. Uh, uh, affliction, possession, affliction, and obsession. All three of those are outlined in Scripture. We're going to give you the Scripture for each one. The Scripture which describes possession, the Scripture which, dis which describes uh, affliction, and the one which describes obsession. And they're all translated from different Greek words into English. And into English you just read that they were troubled by a demon spirit. But the trouble was, as I said, in three different states. The Greek word <coughs> in Luke chapter 8, verse 36, the Greek word used, which means to be controlled or possessed by an evil spirit. Now, I've always had trouble in pronouncing Greek words. I can pronounce the Hebrew words much easier than I can Greek. So, if you have a strong concordance, you can read and then get the definition of these words where I got it. <clears throat> This word used for possession in the Greek is, I'm going to spell it for you, and maybe you can pronounce it correctly, because my wife always tells me I get it wrong. D-I-A-M-O-N-I-Z-O-M-A-I. -I -I. That is the Greek word for possession. When, when that word is used, it means the individual it's talking about is possessed, such as it says in Luke chapter 8, verse 16. There it's talking about a possessed individual that is possessed by a demon. To possess, possession means control or ownership. A born-again believer cannot be possessed because he is possessed by the Holy Spirit. That means ownership or control, what that literally means. Uh, 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 possession. Now, <clears throat> that do not, when I said a born again believer cannot be possessed, it does not mean a, demon, a Christian cannot have a demon. Because we're going to show you that he can have a demon, a born again believer. But he cannot be possessed. That means control totally. He can have a demon by acknowledgement. He acknowledges, in other words, by permission. <clears throat> the Bible says in Acts 10, 38, that Jesus had been commissioned to heal those that had been oppressed by the devil. That's the next word we want to get to, oppressed. Oppressed, all right. The word for oppression was translated uh, in, in uh, uh, Greek word, uh, the English word oppression 
was translated from the Greek word. I'm going to spell this one too. K-A-T-A-D-U-N. I'll try to pronounce it, but I, I always get it wrong when I do. K-A-T-A-D-U-N-A-S-T-E-U-O. That's a different Greek word, but that means that means uh, that he is oppressed. Every born again believer is oppressed by the devil. Oppressed by the devil. That means he's trying to interfere with your work for Jesus. And he has many different ways and many different plans to do it. One of the greatest and most successful plans is try to drown you in personal problems trying some way to turn your energy and effort inward. So you spend your time, it's like you're drowning in water and you're just grabbing every uh, leaf that passes in an attempt to hold your nose above the water. It's just trying to hold your head above the problems that come your way every day, every day. Oh, I don't know what I'm gonna do about the rent. I ain't got the money for the rent this time. My electric bill hadn't been paid. We're getting short of the I don't know what we're going to do this month. All of those kind of problems that we deal with every day of our life. Most of them are brought there through the manipulation of circumstances. This is how they do it. They manipulate circumstances to create as many problems as they can that was going to interfere with your daily life. And they do a good job of it. We all know that because we all have it. That is one of their most successful problems in, in oppressing Christians. It's trying to get them away from doing their duty. And we find according to Bible itself, it says God has in his kingdom hundredfold producers, sixtyfold producers, and thirtyfold producers. What does that tell you? that tell you that two-thirds of the Christians are slackers. That only one-third of the born-again believers are actually carrying the load. That's what it tells you. So we see now that we have a lot of people that could be doing more. Now what does it take for you to be a hundredfold producer? No. Simply do your best for God. Give him your best first. God would never require of you anything that he did not equip you to do. And whatever he gave you to do, if you do it with all your might unto the glory of God, you are a hundredfold producer. I had a, a brother-in-law that married my oldest sister that live the kind of life to prove what I'm talking about. He was a carpenter maker. One of the best, and he had such a reputation that when people would build those big fine homes and they wanted elaborate carpet uh, cabinets, they would get him to make the cabinet. His son, my nephew, growing up, wanted to be uh, following his father's footsteps. He wanted to be a, car, a cabinet maker. So my brother-in-law was teaching him. He got to the stage to where he thought he was almost as good as his father. So his father would give him a job to do by himself. And then after he did it and told him the job was done, my brother-in-law would come and inspect it. They had a very expensive job. He decided to let my nephew out one day in one of the biggest homes built in that subdivision. And when he went to inspect it, my brother-in-law said, son, look, here's a flaw where you made a mistake. Where? He showed him again, this is your mistake. Oh, he said, dad, nobody can see that. Only you, you've got a trained eye. He said, Jesus, sees it. We're working for him. Tear it out and let's do it again. You mean we've got to tear the whole thing out? You know how much that costs us? Tear it out. If we don't do it right, we don't do it. That's what I'm talking about, doing your best. It's not 
5 o'clock payday we're looking for. You might have a job teaching school. You might have a job working in the service station. You might be a carpenter working to build a home. Whatever you are doing, the Lord said, I'll put you there. I had a friend, another friend, right up here in St. Louis. He worked for a long time that airplane plant when he was making airplanes there. He worked in there for a long time in the office. And as he watched the payrolls made, he sees people that's working on the peace out on the assembly line was working by peace. They got paid by the peace for what they produced. He saw they was making much more money than he was, so he continued to try to get transferred to work. Finally he got it. Finally he got his wish. They transferred him out to the line and he worked on a line. He'd been there about two days when his man working next to him come up to him and said, hey, slow down. You're making me look bad. What? Slow down? You're making me look bad. You're doing too much, too fast. Oh, he said, wait, wait, wait a minute, I, I, don't, I didn't come out here to make you look bad. I, I know that they're paying me my check every, every month for what I do. But I'm not really working for them. You see, I'm a Christian. I believe that I'm supposed to do my best. So I'm working for Jesus. Oh, the guy says, and he walks off. So I left him alone for about two weeks more. Then the union man comes to see him and said, hey, you causing a ruckus in the whole plant. Slow down. You're making the people on the line look bad. Slow down. Again, he had to go through the same thing. So they let him alone for another week. And then finally they come back and said, you will have to do something. We can't let this go on. We can't let this go on. Everybody out there is disturbed over it. You're making them all look bad. We're all looking bad. You've got to slow down. So he quit. He quit his job rather than slow down because he was thoroughly convinced he was working for Jesus. Do your best. That's all God asks you to do. If you're a dairy, if you're a farmer, whatever you are, wherever you find yourself, there you learn to be content because God placed you there. Until he moves you, be content. Amen. Don't try to invent a job. God opened and closed doors. Everybody can't do the same job. What a bad country we would have if we was all teachers or all preachers or all carpenters. What a terrible world we'd have. We got to have. Everybody's got a place in God's kingdom. He's not a respecter of persons. He doesn't look at one better than the other. We have different talents, we have different jobs, and we have to do our jobs to the best of our ability in order to be a hundredfold producer. If he sends you and I both out there and said, climb that mountain all the way to the top, and we give it our efforts, all that we could do, you make it to the top, but I only make it halfway up. But I gave it every strength I had. Therefore, in God's eyes, we both mountain climbers because we did our best. And that's all he asked you to do. Yet, two-thirds of the Christians don't do it. He says that. Only one-third is a hundredfold producer. Only one-third was like the man that worked in the airplane plant or like my brother-in-law. They wouldn't do it if they couldn't do it right. They just wouldn't do it. It had to be right. It had to be the best that they could do, or they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't do it. In Luke chapter 18, Jesus tells us the story of the rich wrong, wrong ruler. He was a good man, a keeper of the law. He honored his father and his mother. He sought from Jesus the way to salvation. When Jesus told him that his wealth stood between him and salvation, he was very sad because he was not willing to remove it. Jesus said how hard it was for a rich man to enter heaven. The English word rich found here is translated from the Greek word spelled P-L-O-U-S-I-O-U-S, -O -O -S, means 
abounding with, from the root word, pimplemen, or P-I-M-P-L-E-M-I, -E to influence or control. This, of course, is obsession. He was obsessed with his wealth. Many things besides wealth could become an obsession in this in the individual's life. So we see obsession is anything in one's life that will influence the individual to act or do irrational things. Wealth is not the only thing in this world that can become an obsession in the life of an individual. We see from such scriptures as Luke chapter 4 verse 6, And the devil said unto him, to Jesus, all power will give I thee and glory of them, for that he is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will I give it. Therefore the devil, by his own mouth, can give those things that become obsessions to our flesh. Doesn't have to be wealth. Many different things can be an obsession. An obsession is anything that cause you to, to turn away from your duty to God. Christians can be obsessed to this degree he can have a demon. We see where they can be they cannot be possessed, but they can be obsessed and of uh, and have an obsession in their life. And there's different Greek words for that was translated in English to, to describe what they do. So that means if they can be attacked three ways, there must be three ways to defeat them. And there is the three ways to defeat them. Now, the question we asked here is, can a Christian have a demon? We found out that to certain stages, he can have a Christian. But to really settle that issue, and I said this before a group of ministers one time, how are we going to determine if a Christian can have a demon? The simplest way we can determine that is ask the question, was Paul a Christian? Was Paul a Christian? What do you mean? Because the Bible says that Paul was had a demon that of that afflicted his flesh every day. Every day. To the degree that he learned to glory in the infirmities of his flesh. And it was done by a demon spirit. Well, we see later that Paul worked all kind of miracles. He even had a a cloth that you could touch his body and touch a sick person and they would be healed. But we see later on that he himself was sick but he couldn't heal himself. We see that he cast out demon spirits. Later on we see he couldn't cast out on himself. Does that really present a conflict in scripture? What happened there? On the surface, it appears to be a conflict. But we know truth cannot conflict itself. So there has to be something else there. What is a conflict? So many people tell me, I've had people tell me that I can't believe that Bible because it's got too many conflicts in it. Show me a conflict, I ask. And so they do. And what they show me on the surface may appear to be such as this. I had one of the biggest preachers, I guess, I won't even name him because he's close to here, who argued me in the face that Paul just didn't have enough faith to handle his own problem. And today he still believes that. Today he still believes that. If Paul didn't have enough faith, God help us all when it comes to faith. One of the Ten Commandments says, Thou shalt not bear false witness a lie. The Bible teaches in Revelation chapter 21 verse 8 that all liars shall have their place in the lake of fire. There is no place in Scripture where any exception is made. Yes, 
we see in Hebrews chapter 11 31 that harlot the Rahab is listed in the faith heroes hall of fame and her one contribution for getting there she told a lie she told a lie she saved the lives of the spies and her own life by simply telling a lie and hiding them in 1 Samuel chapter 16 verse 1 through 4 we see God commanding Samuel to go and anoint David to be king over Israel Samuel at first refused to go he, he said to David no if Saul catches me he'll kill me God said let's do a little substitute take me a helper and if you get caught tell him you're going over there to commit a sacrifice was that God telling Samuel to tell a lie another conflict in scripture what is it this is some deep stuff the only way you're going to find it is rightly divide the word of truth on all the subjects just like the Bible said and you'll know the truth do you know God has a system of toleration which he found was necessary because God made a perfect law and then set it down to control an imperfect man it couldn't work he would kill the man the letter of law would kill him so he had to create a system of toleration until he reached a different way which came in the New Testament we're going to leave the letter behind when we get there and go to the spirit because the letter kill it because man is basically evil and corrupt and imperfect and unable to live with a perfect law the law makes no exceptions there is no such ex exception to anything in the law yet God had to find a way of course he had no problem finding a way because he's the creator of all things he knew man was imperfect and he knew he could not keep a perfect law he knew that we see in 2nd Chronicles chapter 18 verse verse 18 through 22 we read an act of judgment that God brought by the telling of lies in this narration we read the following story God wanted to stop King Ahab and bring judgment upon him for his evil ways in order to do this the certain way he could do it certain circumstances had to be manipulated to accomplish this manipulation God instructed one of his servants to become a lying spirit in the mouth of Ahab's prophets they was to lie to Ahab which would lead him into a trap and cost him his life and accomplishes and it accomplished God's judgment solely by the telling of the lie now if we read the whole story of Samuel going to to uh, commit the sacrifice but actually to anoint David king over Israel where he was started from and where he had to go in between that distance Saul had a company of prophets and David knew those prophets was there I mean Samuel knew those prophets were there he also knew if they caught him they were going to tell Saul and Saul would kill him so he as he went on his journey sure enough the prophets really waylaid him and they wanted to know where he was going 
what his business was. He lied to them. To convince them, he asked them to join him in the sacrifice. After his foray with them, he went on to Jesse's house, and there he ultimately anointed David king over Israel. But a lie. Is that a conflict in Scripture? What is that? We know the Bible don't contradict itself because it's true. And truth cannot contradict itself. Then what are we looking here that on the surface appears to be conflict? Well, first, if we would look, we've got to find the answer by going below the surface. That means go back to the original language. Language translation always produces some gaps. I know, for instance, let's take one of our favorite words. I believe in Jesus. Believe, believe. In English, that word literally means intellectual acknowledgement. Goes right back to that intellectual faith. You believe. But if we look at under the surface of that word, simply looking it up in a Greek dictionary, well, first look it up in the most concise American dictionary, and you have a half page of explanation of what believe means, and it boils down to intellectual acknowledgement in English. But you look in that Greek dictionary, and you've got 33 pages of meaning of what it means. Look how much was cut off just by translating it from Greek in English. The sum total, after you rightly divide it in the Greek language, the sum total means to embrace. To believe means to embrace. To take it into you. To become part of it. To obey. To do. It implies all of that. That's not implied in English. So we see the surface underneath is the real truth where there's no apparent conflict at all whatsoever. In the Great Commission as recorded in Mark 16, 17, we see that the believers are given the authority to cast out devils in the name of Jesus. We also see the same chapter that they're given authority to lay hands on the sick and the sick shall be healed. In Acts chapter 16, verse 18, we see a believer by the name of Paul act with the authority and cast out devils. Next, we see this same believer work with the authority and heal by performing special miracles of healing. In Acts 19.11 in Acts following, later we see this same believer in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 through 12, unable to cast out an evil spirit from his own body or work the American of healing for his own infirmities. What do we believe when we see this? Is it more conflicts? We make once again the emphatic statement, truth cannot contradict itself. Therefore, if the Bible's true, we say it is, we believe it is, we know it is, therefore there's no conflict there, and we have to find out why. We have to be able to explain this to people. They want to know, they have a right to know. If we teach in the Bible and we say there's no conflict, how can we prove there's no good? We have to go deeper than the surface. Going back to the original language that the Bible's written in, we know for a fact, first, the Bible is written in three languages, three separate languages. Hebrew and Greek with a little Chaldean. They had to use some Chaldean language because some Hebrew words did not help. were not able to convey the real meaning of the word that, and when it would come over in English, so they had to use a Chaldean word. So some of the original writings of the Bible are Chaldean words, uh, Hebrew, Chaldean, and Greek. And uh, uh, so I had this how, how language is really a problem 
demonstrated to me when I was in France. I traveled over the entire nation of France and, and uh, I started at Paris and we were there for first trip we was there for 30 days we stayed 30 days in France we had a whole line of invitations to go there speak in different churches I was teaching on spiritual warfare and we was up in Normandy when this conflict appeared uh, that really shook me up uh, everywhere I went I didn't know anything about French language it was <laughs> It was Greek to me also, um, uh, I, I, you know, but uh, everywhere I went they furnished a translator who would translate what I said in English into, into French. And uh, we got to Normandy and we had seven nations represented there at that particular. We had uh, five or six uh, doctors from the biggest hospitals in some of the countries in Europe come. And they were all, had been friends in one, I guess, one Bible college, I don't know where they knew each other from, but they knew each other. And they had all been discussing some problems they were having with patients that they couldn't find any medical reason for the problems they were having. And some nurse was talking with them one day and told them there's a man over in Normandy holding a convention on spiritual warfare talking about demon spirits. They said they had talked about demons before but didn't know anything about it. So they decided to come to that seminar. And they were there that day. All of them. And I was, uh, I was talking uh, about some truth in the Bible that related to the female sex. And I said, uh, the word woman. I used the word woman, which I intended to cover all the females in the audience, which would have had that been in America. And after the meeting was over, a young lady came up and through my translator she asked me a question. How come that same truth did not apply to the single women in the audience? I said, it does. I thought I said that. I found out that the way I used the word woman could not be translated to mean the same thing in French. When it was translated, it came out wife. Wife in France. So it left out the single women. Just by translation, it made a difference. What a difference it made. That's where I got my first lesson of how to be very careful. I was talking the other night about those dreams and how God gave me the, the warning in advance about and what do you let me see that counsel working up there and he used the word in the English it says we wrestle and I was always puzzled, puzzled by that word that's a sporting term wrestle wrestle there's not a sporting bone anywhere in that enemy he is the most dirtiest fighting, murdering, rascal that's ever been created. So it puzzled me. Why would the writers of the Bible use a sporting term? Because of the definition. The definition of rascal is the same definition in every language on earth. It doesn't change. Rassel means contact contest. There has to be contact before a wrestling match can be called a wrestling match. If they get in the ring, snort, snort, jump around, they're not wrestling till contact is made. That's when a wrestling, that's when a wrestling match starts. So we're going to have contact not with flesh and blood. We're flesh and blood. But the fight we're in is not flesh and blood. And we're going to have contact. There is a place of contact. Where do we contact the enemy or where do the enemy contact us? On the battlefield. You're not always on the battlefield in spiritual war or any war. No matter what kind of warfare you're in, you're only on the battlefield when you come in contact with that enemy. Mm. That's the battlefield. Yeah. And you're going to meet him on the battlefield. 
and you're going to defeat him or he's going to defeat you. There's no draw. There's no ties in this war. You win or you lose. It's just that simple. You win or you lose. The battlefield in spiritual warfare <coughs> up here. You win it or you lose it up here. You don't even have to act it out here to lose it. Just lose it up here. And you've lost it. You've lost it. That's the battlefield. He outlines the weapons that's necessary for that for you to be victorious in every encounter. When that enemy, enemy drops that thought in your mind, if it's tempting you, you deal with it a different way. If it's buffeting your flesh, you, diff you deal with it a different way. If it's an obsession, you deal with it a different way. All three ways the attack has to be handled in all different, word, different ways. Now we know in God's Word, We want to see how these work. Now, we see God created the world, the whole thing, one time. And let's, let's draw a picture in our mind of what he did when he did this. God is infinite. We're finite. That means we're controlled by our physical senses. We're finite creatures. God's infinite. As he created everything, let's put it like this. Just draw a globe, and around that globe, he put a ribbon called time. Now time was going to create, was going to control the creation. When God started, it was like putting a train on a track. It started on time, and it's going around and come back to where it started on time. His schedule calls for time. Now, God don't have any time out there. There's no time in the infinite world. The time is in the finite world. That's where the time is. So God created time just for us. And he put time on a schedule. And he had to create a driver, just like an engineer that's running a train. He knows the schedule. He knows at what stops he has to be at at what time. The driver that God created has to know what time in order to keep creation on schedule, running toward the end. It's running toward the end. And it has to keep it on schedule. To drive time, God created natural laws. We call them nature. Nature now becomes the the driver of the schedule to keep it on schedule but God has two separate worlds he has actually in Hebrew he's got three but in Greek he's got two and we want to use those two separate words logos and rhema both are translated in English to say the word of God but one might be Logos and one might be Rhema and there's as much difference between those two words as it's daylight and dark. You have to know the difference. Is it Logos when it says the Word of God or is it Rhema? Let's say for general purposes we'll describe Logos as the general written Word of God. It makes no exception to any law. Any law. If you defile defy the law of nature, you will have to pay a penalty. Don't believe it? Go out there and climb up on top of this building and step off. See if you don't fall. You say, but Lord, I'm saved. It don't make no difference. If you save, you're going to fall. You defied the law of God, gravity. And if you defy the law of gravity, there is retribution for it. Gravity will make you pay. It will make you pay if you defy it. So there's no exception to gravity. Therefore, there is no way, according to his word, that a miracle is possible. Every miracle has to defy the logos of God in order to be a miracle. Therefore, God made a way with his word, Ramah. 
his specific spoken word, which is greater than Logos. Now let's look at it this way. Suppose Logos, nature, is driving time on schedule, and it gets to a point where Rhema is bringing something important for God. Very, very important. What happens? They meet at the same time. Logos yields. He yields to Rhema. Because a lesser word has met a greater word. Right there. And Rhema goes through. It's like when I was a police officer. Many times the police had to go out and direct traffic after some big accident. And the red light, the traffic light kept going. Yet the police would wave the people on through the red light. Did that negate the red light? No. And, and, and that just made an exception. You were allowed by law to, to run the red light. Therefore, there was no violation there. And it's the same way when Rama and Logos meet. Rama takes the place. It takes the right away. Therefore, the spoken specific word of God overtakes uh, Logos. Every miracle is performed by a rhema. We are given a rhema in the Bible. The word of God that we use. Mark chapter, uh, what, nine, what is it? Mark 9, nine 20 something I believe it is, where it says, all things are possible to him that can believe. That's a rhema. If you just can believe, that's where the miracles come in. All things are possible by rhema, by rhema. All miracles in the Bible are worked by rhema word. All miracles are violation of logos. To work miracles, God must overrule his own word without either contradicting or defying it. Furthermore, this is not an exception to his rule. He makes no exceptions, but he does overrule. The great word, Rhema, will overrule the lesser word, Logos. This is the only way a miracle can be performed. All these things are obvious in the original language. They're all obvious in the original language. I believe it's about time for lunch, isn't it? Did I say 12 o'clock? Or am I looking at it wrong? Yes, lunch right now. Huh? This is the best food. We're, we're eating meat. <laughs> exactly. uh, I don't want to go too long, you know. After all, I eat here sometimes too, you know. <laughs> but by the same token, uh, this is just starting in two of the first chapters of about 14 chapters, so we ain't going to be able to get through it. We're going to try to go a little, and I'm trying my best just to touch on the high point uh, of this. Uh, but one of the next things we have to do as we're dealing with demons is understand which ones we're dealing with. Because we discover that no, not all demons are alike. They're just like human beings. You can travel all day long. You might find some people that fav favor each other, but you can't find any two that looks alike, just alike. Or are equal in their job. So are spirits in the same way. They're individuals, just as you and I are individuals. They have individual strengths. Some are much stronger than others. In fact, if you look at the demon world, what you're going to see is the closest thing in this life to the caste system is how Satan's uh, system is organized. But in the caste system, the people are organized uh, from the uh, highest order to the bottom, to the lowest bottom. And they're, they're there by birth. But in the satanic world, they're there by strength. With the strongest demons at the top, from that order comes the princes that rule the principalities. And each order become lower and lower and lower until the very bottom. One of the most amazing things about the master plan that I was allowed to look at, and I saw the schedule, the same schedule that, uh, that um, uh, John saw, and he wrote about in Revelation, uh, that master plan of Satan to take over the world. The very order of spirits that he used to accomplish his greatest purpose in that is the weakest of all the demons. He is literally the outcast of the demonic world and he is despised 
a demon that is actually despised by the other demon. Now you, you think how, uh, what kind of creature this has to be. And, and it is described, show you how important it is. John described him in the 16th chapter of the book of Revelation, verse 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs. And that's what it looks like. And I saw it, an overgrown, green, slough, uh, slimy frog. That's what it looked like. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of devils, working miracles. You didn't know the devil could work miracles? Get ready. You're going to see a supernatural act of fireworks. Because it's coming. We're going to see the devil his emissaries, his ministers performing all kind of miracles and the church praising. Look at that. That's from God. It's supernatural. You better know what you're looking at. Well, we're fixing to see it happen. It's coming. These spirits here have accomplished in 15 years what Satan's been trying to do for 6,000 years. These, the weakest of his spirit, they're responsible for the same-sex marriage that's going on in this world. And it's the key to his success in taking the world as the Antichrist. Every nation is passing laws. Even these little country nations in the court right now in the United States. I mean in Mississippi. They just federal judge just ruled that the Mississippi law man and wife, man and woman marriage is unconstitutional. Just ruled that. Fourteen states in the United States have in their state constitution that no one who is not a Christian can hold public office in that state. Mississippi is one of those states and it's under trial in the federal court right now. They have attacked it. Just 14 states are left that has that in their state constitution. That you have to be a Christian in order to hold public office in the state. Now, the United Atheist Organization has gone to court against those 14 states. So we'll watch them knock that down next. It's coming because the Bible said it was. And I'm going to read you where it says it was. The last great conspiracy, conspiracy, where the leaders of the world, that's the people that rules the law, are standing in agreement with the devil. They have been deceived to believing that which is bad is good. And that which is good is bad. Just as Isaiah said they would. Here it is in the book of Psalms where the prophet said, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Conspiracy between the rulers and the lawmakers of the world than the devil himself and they don't know. They're blind to the fact where they're leading us in this pit of no end. No end. All these years, the church in this country has literally done nothing. And they were only the people that could do something. Just learn to put Christ work first. But instead, we serve Satan by serving his God, his God that he sent to take the place of Christ. The same God I served for 30 years and didn't know it. Called S-E-L-L. -L. Oh, how lovely is that old self. How lovely. It's hard to put him down, isn't it? It's hard to put him on the side and replace him with Jesus. It's hard. 
but it's not impossible. You have to make the choice. You have to make the choice. The time has come to end the game that we've been playing. He wants you to become real. I wish I had more time today, but I'm going to have to quit now. But one day, the Lord says the same before He comes. Maybe we can come back and pick up right here. Where we just got started because I'd like to explain the different ways that we have to deal with different demons. One of those orders of demons is very, very important today because if we knew how to deal with him effectively, we could wipe, close all the hospitals and all the doctor's office in our hand. And that particular demon I call him the mystery demon. He is the one that was used and the only one that is known by five separate names in the Bible. Five that one order of spirits. In Matthew 17, Jesus called him a different kind. In Mark chapter 9, he called him an evil spirit. Oh, no, 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 yeah. I believe, no, a deaf and dumb spirit. In Psalms uh, 76, he was called an evil spirit from God. But he has five separate names. And he was used by God to bring judgment upon Egypt. And he killed, that order of spirit killed, an entire generation of Egyptians who were in power when the Hebrews were held captive there. That one order of spirit killed the entire, it took them 400 years to kill them. And he killed them all with catastrophic illnesses which the prophets say are coming back today. Fifteen years ago, we wouldn't have known what the word Ebola meant if we saw it in print. We wouldn't have known what cow disease meant if we saw it in print. We wouldn't have known what bird disease print if we saw it in print. Just fifteen years ago. And yet we see those are catastrophe type of, of uh, illnesses that have no known cure and are almost, and along with AIDS, almost the sentence of death for those. And we're told those with the diseases that that order of spirits brought amongst the Egyptians that wiped out the entire generation, the entire generation of them because of their wicked way of living. And I, in the museum of, natural museum of Cairo, Egypt, which was burned, they burned it down now, all the wonderful historic artifacts that was lost in the burning of that fire, just recently in the great uh, rites they had over there when they disposed the only leader they ever had that really gave protection to the Christians in their country. And they, in writing, they burned down that museum. But in that museum, they had the, the figurines, little statues that was buried, buried with those people that were killed by those diseases. And you can see by the statues that they were born with what they were worshiping and why God kill them all. Most of their uh, illegal activity as far as God was concerned was sins against their own bodies or sexual sins. And these uh, images depict all the sexual sins that they were killed. And the two most rampant sexual sins that was during that time when God killed those people was, was uh, number one was, uh, was uh, actually uh, uh, with, rose, with children, using children as objects. What a pity that in many places in this own country, I know we're finding that. I had six, 32 children in my home, little children that was taken from the streets and brought to our home. Eight of those 16 were females. And every one of them had been sexually abused from the age three years on up. Every one of them. Every one of them. Little children. Same thing that happened to Egypt for which God killed them all with catastrophic illness. And we got the same thing. 
I hope not near the scale that it was in Egypt. But the thing about it, God said, you don't have to do those things to be guilty of them. What he said to the people of Egyptians, if you close your eyes to them, I will make you guilty of them. And that's what he's saying to us today. If you hide your eyes from sin, if you don't call it what it is, God said, I'll make you guilty of it. You don't have to do it. Just deny it. And I'll make you guilty of it. And that's why he killed the Egyptians. For what their society proved, he made them all guilty. They were all guilty. Every one of them. Guilty before God. All those, all those little figurines proved Dr. Rosalie David headed that committee in 1980. I believe it was 1988 where they went in there and examined those bodies and identified what killed them. Everyone was killed by a catastrophic illness. And I think the oldest one they found was about 44 years of age. What we can expect. Would you stand with me please? Father, I thank you once again for the privilege of being able to come and share with my brothers and sisters here. Lord, I trust that every word I said, every deed, every thought come from you. And Lord, I ask these people that hear me, don't believe what I said because I said it. Believe only if you can read it in his word. Study that word. Study it like you did your school book. Yes. No, you're going to take a test on it one day because somebody's going to ask you a question that you representing Jesus as his ambassador is supposed to be able to answer. And you answer it rightfully. He said, don't add to or take away from my word. Don't give them an answer that will lead them astray. You have to know his word in order to do that. To be prepared to do it, you need to know his word. Because we're coming into a place where that word, we see right there that we see before our eyes, if we read a newspaper, we listen to the news, we see the war against Christianity as we're going right, right now there after the word of God. But what did that conspiracy say? After they get the word of God banished, they're after his anointed. That's you and I. That's you and I. So we know it's coming. Because the good book said it was coming. Yet we have comfort in this knowledge. That greater is he that lives in us than he that lives in the world. You and God makes a majority. No matter how many people are against you. You and God make a majority. If your name is in that book. God bless each of you. Father, I ask that you touch the heart and life of every individual family that's represented here. As they go in that or, or, or in the kitchen to eat, into the dining room to eat. Bless the food, Father. And bless the bodies of each of them. And bless the hands that prepared the food. Thank you for this opportunity. And it indeed is a great opportunity just to be able to speak for you publicly without fear of any reprisal. I'm not looking for the army or the police to come in and stop me because this is a privilege that you've given me today. Tomorrow it may not be so, but even tomorrow we know who holds tomorrow. We just don't know what tomorrow holds for us. But we know you're in charge of all things, Father, and we thank you for that knowledge. Bless this place. Bless those who work so hard to keep the light shining here. For it indeed is a light. And it's reaching out into the community. Just make it reach across the borders of the nations, Father. In your name we pray. Amen and amen.